and uh, their origin, uh, what happens after they're used, uh, what they're made of. So it's very informative. A uh, couple items before we get into public comment. Uh, there is uh, a SUNY career fair on the 7th of October, and uh, Rachel had made the uh, suggestion that uh, one of us attend. I think she's available to attend, but it might be an opportunity to get more members. Uh, there's also a letter coming out in this uh, this week's uh, New Paltz Times that I think you all, the committee members, commission members, uh, got a copy of that has a call for new members as well as uh, talking about the issue in the Walt Hill River. Um, any agenda changes? I just want yeah. to table okay. home energy audits. Okay, we'll, we will. We're going to table home energy audits since there's nothing new on that. If um, Jen is with us, did we want to add her in? Or did you have comments or anything? Did you want to be part of that? Or? Well, yeah, why don't we do that right after the plastic bag? That's what I was thinking. With, with, the, with the Walker River issue. Yep. Sure. Yeah, and I'll probably take office. Perfect. Sure. That's fine. Yep. That's fine. Okay. And then just want to thank last month we had talked about having more of a social media presence, and we had talked about inviting Dan, who has just run a lot of community Facebook pages and has a good idea of, you know, studying communications. So he'll stay all night, so there's okay. no rush on that one. Well, we'll put that in place of home energy Sounds good to me. <laughs> social media. Okay, so uh, social media goes in place of home energy waters. And I'm just going to steal the writing utensils if I could. And, John, you had, um, the way this commission is formed, we each get to identify issues that are our own interest and passion and promote them. And this plastic bag issue is one that actually you, you brought to the commission. So uh, why don't you get a quick synopsis of what we're proposing, and then we'll open it up to a public comment. The quick synopsis is that this law would um, prohibit the use of plastic bags at the point of retail sale. The aim of the law is to promote the use of reusable bags. Um, so. Really what we were talking about specifically is the bags that are used at the point of checkout. In other words, you bring your items to the cashier and the cashier places those in a plastic bag. Um, we do have several exemptions from the law, uh, plastic bags that would not be affected or impacted. Uh, thin film produce type bags, um, so the kind of things you would get for your vegetables or the smaller bags that you would put your meat in at the supermarket. Um, for example, things to hold deli meats, cheeses, produce, etc. Um, garment bags, such as those used at the dry, dry cleaners, wouldn't be affected. Plastic bags measuring 28 by 36 inches or larger, um, typically used to enclose large items such as artwork or architectural drawings. Those would also be the bags you would see at work sites, the large, thick plastic bags. Those would also be allowed, as well as the plastic bags we use for our household trash, the larger, thicker bags. Um, thick, large plastic bags made of durable plastic, those are those. Um, and the ordinance does not apply to any other type of plastic besides plastic retail checkout bags like plastic container, containers, plastic cups, utensils. Those things are all allowed. Um, importantly, merchants are given six months from the date the law is passed to deplete their inventory um, and you know, going within reason beyond that as, as people deplete the inventory of existing plastic bags is something within reason. Um, so that's basically the scope of the law. Thank you. Um, so that being said, uh, any uh, comments from anyone in the audience? We'd love to hear from you. Yes, sir. Yes, I've got a few minutes. I actually have some take-home kits for all the stuff that I'm going to talk about. So oh, neat. I can look it over. First of all, I want to applaud the village for uh, being proactive and trying to do something positive for the environment. Certainly, you know, great intentions. I don't have any issues with that. And the movie you just saw, uh, Baggage, that came to the middle. I had seen it before. And I must say, you know, it's depressing in a lot of ways, but it was really inspiring for me. I'm happy to see that you showed it. Uh, as much as I could, I stopped using the phthalates and the BPA. In fact, one of the things I did was a guy in the film I called a while back, a Kobe Palmao, to complain about, to, to ask for the stuff I used in Irish Spring body wash. At first they said, oh, it's got fragrance. He said, I know, but fragrance is not you know, just natural oils. What's in it? There's lots of chemicals. Does it have this? So after going back and forth, the family said, yeah, it has. But it's really safe. I can send you some stuff that shows it's totally safe. I said, OK, OK, I'm not going to use it. So it's, you see that movie is really, really cool. But it's really a shameful how much unnecessary and dangerous plastic packaging there is out there. That, that's awful. 
But what I find is that you can watch in that film, I'm glad you showed the film, is that that movie was made in 2010. And there's a lot of stuff that's happened since then. Information that's out there that wasn't available when that film came out. And that's some of the stuff I want to share. It's all, you know, it's not personal opinion. It's all stuff that can be looked up. It's going to give me copies of things where I have them. But uh, so before a decision is made, I'd really like to share some information that you may not be aware of. The first thing is, what's always left out of the equation, and if you hear about, and I've been a big fan of this, you know, these things, is showing my queen's roots, my queen's uh, shopping bag. But what's always left out of the equation is, you know, even when you give up these, the regular plastic bags, oh great, now I'm using a useful bag, great, great, great. You still gotta go home and throw out your stuff. So when you buy a plastic bag, First of all, what you used to get for free, now you're paying for. And then it's going to be something that's thicker, generally, and has a lot of plastic, too. And, you know, it's a wash. The problem with the plastic bags is that they pile up and they end up with 10, 20, 30 of them. So you get too many of them, and you don't have something to do. I think to do with them. Some people hang them on, you know, their closet door or whatever, and throw stuff in them, but they just pile up too much. But either way, you're not getting rid of plastic when you get rid of those. You still got to buy plastic for most people. Some people, you know, if you're able to compost everything and have no waste, more power to you, that'd be fantastic. It's too much plastic otherwise. But, and, I, and I have no love for the, uh, for the plastic council or chemical stuff and all that. And uh, one thing is that I'm a Prius driving vegetarian, an organic food, New Paltz CSA member person. <laughs> so, like, I've been doing this stuff for years. And I you know, love these bags, and I still use them somewhat. But when I touch let me share with you all the stuff that I found. First of all, the latest info I found. In South Australia, which the movie talks about, there was a bag ban that resulted in a significant increase in plastic bag bin liner sales. They said, according to the study, 90% of households in that area like to line their home trash bins with plastic. So before, a lot of them were using the single use bags from the supermarket. So pre ban, 15% of households purchased bags for that purpose. Afterwards, 80%. And officials overall, and there's, you can find this stuff online, didn't really see any reduction in the total amount of plastic use. It just shifted from plastic bags that you got free to the ones you buy in the store. You know, these kind of things. Now, what's up? In San Francisco, there was a bad ban a few years ago in 54 major supermarkets that resulted in slightly higher plastic bag litter counts. Then they extended it to pharmacies, takeout places, convenience stores, and all that. And then it went down. So what they seemed to have learned from that was that the supermarket bag didn't have as much of an effect. They're like the biggest thing out there. And you see, occasionally you'll see one swirling in the wind and all that. But it, they've shown this in San Francisco, because not many studies have been done in this country, that it's the convenience store and the takeout bags. Because when you think about it, one of these regular plastic bags from the supermarket, you got all this stuff in it, it goes home, it goes into the house. If somebody buys a sandwich or whatever, people who don't think people who are stupid and you don't care about the environment will take out the sandwich, take out the bottle, throw the bottle on the floor, throw the thing on the floor, it blows red. So they found that apparently, at least there, tended to be that. Uh, there are other places also, and I'll get this stuff out like DC, Toronto, and Ireland, where similar things have happened. It's not every place, but in a lot of places. And here's one thing I've got to share. In England, they came out a couple of years ago with a study. It was done in 2006. Anybody wants to read all 119 pages, feel free. <laughs> With the seven page summary in front that I'll give out. What this is, it measured the life cycle assessment of all different kinds of supermarket bags in it. And what happened was, what it came out with was saying that when you reuse plastic bags as a bin line in your home, that that's the greenest thing. Because of the amount of stuff that work that goes in, energy used to produce it, the transport, and all that stuff that you have to use like a reusable cloth bag 300 times for it to be as green as a plastic bag if you reuse it. So if you bring stuff in, in a bag, and then you use that same bag to throw your stuff out, and you're really selective about how many bags you take, and you recycle those bags you don't need. And if you're going to use one of these things, I'll get to that in just a second. I'm sure a lot of people use these kind of bags to go shopping with. What the problem is, it hasn't gotten that much press, is the bacteria issue. And from where? It's from the food placed in the bags. Because in California, they just now, I'm going to hand this thing out too, they just came out with practical tips. Even the California places are banning bags, they, on the other side of it, the um, health agency in California, came out with a whole list of things that you should be doing to make sure that it doesn't spread disease. 
because it's hard to say, oh, I got sick because of that bed. But what they found is, there's a University of Arizona study that found only 3% of shoppers wash the bags frequently. And if everyone did that, there'd be massive water and energy use. But they found that 90% of the bags had dangerous bacteria that they studied. Half had coliform, 8% had E. coli. And this guy, Dr. Sinclair, who's the professional, professor of public health, said these bags, when you don't wash them, are just like shoe bottles. Because you put them outside, they go like this. Any other issues in the car, if you, most people store them in the car. So if they got even stuff like broccoli, or maybe there was something frozen that got it wet, and maybe a meat dripped in there, especially if you don't use the plastic bags, the produce bags, to, the, to put it in there first, it's going to get all kinds of stuff in it, all kinds of bacteria. Then it sits in the car baking. So, and the thing, if, if, if everybody washed these things all the time, it'd be no problem. They're great. But, but people don't do that. And it's just the thing of, and it's not going to be necessarily able to pinpoint it exactly, but you've got to, think, got to really got to think about these things before it just gets enacted because it's the trendy thing to do. You know? Uh, Time Magazine just came out with some stuff. Uh, I'm not going to go over all this stuff. I'll hand that along. Basically, there are two types of these bags also. You've got the cloth bags, which you can wash in a washing machine in hot water, and it kills it. And that's great. Just throw them in the wash. Then you've got the other kind, which are these things, which are made out of woven plastic, polypropylene. And some of them say, some of them don't say anything about washing. Some of them say hand washing cold water. Some of them say machine washing cold water. But the problem is, even if you do that, that doesn't kill the stuff. If you wash it in hot water, it's going to ruin the bag. And the problem is, there's no way of, people don't recycle these. They give them out, you end up with tons of these things. I got tons of these things. Because they give them out free at events you go to, whatever. Oh, here's a bag from a radio station. Or if people don't, if people forget to bring their cloth bag or whatever to the store, they go to stop and shop, it's like, oh, I don't feel like, you know, I have to buy another one because that's the only option. So you end up with still another one of these, and people forget to bring them. So this is going to happen when millions of these things pile up. They end up going to the landfill because there's nothing you can do with them. So that there are a lot of issues, you know, happening with these stuff. So in sum, just to think about all these issues, I'm going to give you some stuff to look at also. But what I'm recommending is, my suggestion if I ran the world or ran the would be, first of all, keep the plastic bags and place signage in the stores. Anybody got plastic bags, educate people about how to use each type of bag. For plastic, take only as many as you need. Fill them up full so you can use fewer bags. We use them as trash bin liners. Uh, one of the things, I, I have to honestly say, I, I was in advertising for years and years, and I was totally against plastic bags. And a friend of mine who's an inventor, invented this thing, which is a bin that's got these rubber bags, calls it, that the bag hooks on so you can use those bags as that. I got involved with them, and I'm now working with them. I moved up here from Queens just last year. And I got involved in, with this stuff also, just to be honest. But I'm not here to sell the bin. I'm just saying, that's how I got into it, because I started reading about all this stuff. And it was like, I had no idea about this stuff. I thought the, the canvas bags were the way to go. And the other thing is, you know, Bring them back to the store and recycle them. You have to train people to do that. You know, that's because the problem is they have a bin in the store and nobody knows to do that. Very few people do. And for the reusable tote bags, if you use them, the cloth bags are better. But you got to make sure you wash them all the time. Do all the recommended things. California is, is ahead of the curve by issuing this stuff. Maybe New York will at some point. And the cheap reusables end up being, you know, not such a bargain because you, you can't wash them easily in the way they're supposed to be washed. Could you uh, stick your name so we can get the minutes? Yes, I oh, should. Yeah? Oh, good. Yes. Okay, great. And I, if I could just go through and address some of those issues. Be my guest, yeah. Yeah. Um, so part of the thing that we would have to do if we were going to enact this would be um, to get some education and information out to the public, um, specifically about the bacteria issue that you mentioned. Um, the, the type of bag that you showed, there are issues where you have to be careful about how you wash them, otherwise they degrade. Um, but the canvas bags obviously would be the ideal. Those can be washed in hot water. Um, so we would certainly have to educate people about proper bag usage. There's also the thicker plastic bags, which if you go to Stop and Shop now, you have those. Those you can actually turn inside out and wash with dish detergent and hot water, and you can get many uses out of them. Um, the nice thing about those bags is that they're larger, and so they fit more items. Um, and they're going to last longer than a plastic bag, you know, quite a bit, significantly longer in terms of how many times 
you use them. So if you do know how to wash them, you do take appropriate care of them, you're going to get more life out of them and ultimately reduce the amount of plastic that's in the environment. Um, what else did I write down here? We actually, for the village of New Potts, don't have any jurisdiction over the supermarkets. So we're sure. talking about specifically within the village. Um, but the way that this law is written is it impacts all of the businesses within the village. So that would include your delis, that would include you know, your food stores. We're saying no one's going to use plastic. And so that's one of the things you talk what about. What about the whole trash issue? Do you have any comments? The trash bags. Using larger trash bags? Well, just the idea that the people, a lot of people you know, use these bags at home for trash. Certainly. So um, you get rid of those, they just have to buy them. You still got to do, that's, that's avoided all the time. Sure. One of, one of the things that we've talked about and we have to talk about it um, further is partnering with businesses and trying to reach out to them as well to make them aware of the different advertising options in terms of plastic bags and ways in which it can be beneficial to businesses to make those bags more available. Certainly community events in the future and things like that. Um, I do understand what you're saying about that not meeting all of the bag needs. It's my hope that um, the other options available to people through the supermarkets would be sufficient to meet their reusable bag needs. Was uh, there any, anyone else who wanted to uh, comment on? Oh, Karen was here. I thought she was going to say something. Um, anyone else who would like to make a comment on that? Why don't you introduce yourself, sir? Hi, Dan Torres, Village of New Falls. Um, one of the things I was curious about, just looking at this draft law, and I believe that you had spoken earlier that we wanted to use, or you guys wanted to use the law from another municipality that in the event there was a court case that uh, if it was held up, then one would assume uh, potentially they want a new false would be as well. Um, and I know that there's a date here that they set whenever this was passed for when this would go into effect. When were you guys thinking, assuming that this law was passed today, how long would you want it, or would you think it should be before it would come into effect? The way that, yeah, the way the language is written, it takes six months from the time that it's passed to when it could be, uh, you know, when the violation period would begin. So six months. Um, and then I think you have the option to write in that people that have the pre-existing plastic bag source, like say, you know, the larger retailers, if they have existing plastic bags, they can exhaust that store of existing bags within reason. Um, so that's kind of more open-ended, but the way it's written in the law, it's six months from the date of enactment. And I think we had talked about trying to make sure we got past the coming winter holiday season. Yeah. Um, because that's when people would have the chance to exhaust less their supplies theoretically. Mm -hmm. They still have some. Um, I, I would just suggest too that, first of all, having the conversation is important as well, and you're educating people through that. But that in the event that this does go through, that it's a, and I'm sure I don't have to say this, it's a wonderful opportunity to do that education in the middle of six months to let people know what's going on and all the rest. Um, and just two other quick things I had as well was I just want to let you guys know that in recycling center's draft budget there is a line to buy reusable bags um, my hope had been at in the event that this passes either the village or the town it would be a nice way to say you know one, one of the concerns that I heard from people was well are you going to make a family have to choose between buying bags or buying groceries for that first time after this happens and I understand that so I thought that, that was a nice way to be able to advertise the town recycling center which is the revenue source of the town and then also give people that alternative if that happens. And even if it doesn't happen, it's a nice thing to have either way. And we did actually discuss some of the issues with what kind of reusable bag you could get as well. Um, and, and lastly, I would just say, if in the event this does go forward, I, I do think it might be wise to ask the town and village to take it on at the same time. Did you um, look at the net bags, like the ones they had in the movie? Because it seems to me that those would be the most efficient because they would use so much less material. Mm -hmm. So that in order to wash them, you'd only be washing something this big if it were scrunched up, but then if it were filled, it would expand out. I don't know whether you would. I mean, right now it's just a line item with a, an amount, and I don't remember what the grant was. We would get a good amount of the money back as, as, as well, so it would be great for the taxpayers. Uh, but I will say that there was a number of articles I read about the hypocrisy of some of the bags and some of the materials that they were made out. So I haven't really looked too much into what we want to do, but I did a lot of reading on what you shouldn't do and what are common mistakes that are made with those bags. And, and I learned a lot. I was unaware of a number of those issues as well. Get your great new reusable bag made out of plastic. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. 
Um, do you, I don't want to put you in the spot. Can you, can you give us a quick uh, update? You at one point in time talked to the corporate office of, of Shop and Stop. And I, I did. Shop, right? um, they were less than thrilled with uh, the phone call that I gave them. They, uh, they, they said that this is kind of a feel-good thing that a lot of communities do who think they're more progressive than they are. That is a direct quote that was said to me. Um, and they said that they're always willing to work with communities to do drop-offs for bags or push more of their reusable bags. They were not at all in favor of the um, reusable bags. And I, would, I was told that they would even go as far as to um, speak out against them if need be. Um, and they've dealt with it before in other communities. I don't know what success they've had, but they have come across this issue before. Thank you. I appreciate it. Uh, Dan is a town council, council person and has been working on this on behalf of the town. So thank you. Appreciate it. Any other comments? I just wanted a question. Has uh, the village considered uh, the option of a bag fee for a part of it? Let's say they charge five cents for bags. To discourage it, but still made them available, where half the money could go to the store and half goes to the village to be used for recycling purposes or whatever to do good. I think that was part of the conversation. At, what, at one point, we have at least talked about it. I, I think yeah. uh, uh, I think the, the idea was to, to go with the van. I, that, there's been a lot of concern about what we call the equity issue about forcing people to choose between food and, and, uh, and bags. And the, the, if we can generate reusable bags from either the recycling center or the business community, that just seemed like a, a, a better way to mitigate that problem than charging people to use the bag. So it just seems like it's a good compromise because if somebody wants to pay their five cents and get the bag, fine. If they want to use their, their reusable bag, they can do that too. It's not penalizing anybody. And then it should cut down. You know, it's a good compromise, just something to consider. Uh, Dennis, then Dan. Oh, I just want to comment on that okay. point, just, just for a point of clarification. I believe that municipalities are not allowed to do that without home rule legislation from the state legislator. Cities, I think, can impose those type of taxes. I do not mm -hmm. believe that towns can. Okay. By the way, in New York City, what they're considering right now is doing a five or a ten cent tax fee, but all of it would go to the supermarkets, which seems kind of questionable because. <laughs> Uh, just to get back to the supermarkets, Dan, when you spoke to Stop and Shop, did they indicate what their big opposition was? Is it the cost of this plastic versus paper? See, the cost didn't come up as a big thing because I had said that I, I had thought that there was a fee in. I think it was a five cent. I think that may have been discussed here. And what I was told is that they've gotten rid of that at one point. I don't know when that was, but that fee is no longer handed down to the consumer or at least according to the government relations person that I spoke with. I, and this was a while back. I don't remember what the specific opposition was, more than just the hassle of having to convert over the bags. Well, I, I know at one, at one supermarket in town, they, rather than charging a fee for using plastic bags, they give you a discount of 15 cent per reusable bag. Mm -hmm. So they approach it the other way. Stop and Shop used to give you five cents Every bag you use. Don't they still do that? Or they no. Shoprite, I believe, still does. Yeah, if you right. use your own reusable bags, they give you a credit. Yeah, they'll just do. Mm -hmm. Even if you bring your own plastic bag. Yeah. Even if it's. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Is just as far as the inconvenience to business owners and the opposition they have, has there been any consideration towards buying paper bags in bulk, maybe through the chamber or through some other organization, and then being able to? spread the cost, you know, just kind of buy them in bulk, pass along the savings to the businesses and everybody can win, we can be, you know, a greener community and help businesses increase their profit lines a little bit. I don't think that's, that's, that particular option has been discussed and it sounds like it's going to be a good one. So, one one yes. thing that we did discuss and Don sort of brought this up is um, when Dan had mentioned uh, reusable bags being given out by the recycling center was Don had mentioned, or the local businesses. And one thing that we had talked about as a possibility was having local businesses come together and give some money, each business, towards the bags. And then having reusable bags made, you know, and we would discuss materials, obviously, um, with their advertisements on them so that these bags are get, being given out. Money that those companies or, you know, the shops would have spent on plastic bags, they would be putting towards these reusable bags and their advertising. So if they're reusable, you know, and you know, if stores want to, let's say, give like a 10% discount for having this bag that has their advertisement on it, things like that. So just to, you know, it encourages people to use them, it encourages the stores to get involved, and they can be given out for free so that there's not an additional cost to the 
you know, active person. So then that concern of do I pay for food or do I pay for this bag, hopefully wouldn't be a concern. Absolutely. And that, that seems like it's more as trying to get things off the ground and get people going with it. And, you know, like I think you mentioned there are certain people that are always just going to fight it or never find time in their day to make a priority or something like that. So I think any way that we can find a way to get this done and help the businesses make yeah. money at the same time. And I think if, you know, with a, with a six month or whatever, whatever loan, the, the, the gap is, that gives a ticking clock. We have to solve this problem by this date. And I think that's how things get done in, in human nature to my, my I have experience. some uh, information that was sent to me in a summary of discussion with merchants and towns that have passed ordinance such as these. Um, all merchants we interviewed notice an increase in reusable bags, and I'll tell you the towns. It was Southampton, New York. Westport, Connecticut, Telluride, Colorado, Brownsville, Texas, and Chestertown, Maryland. Um, all merchants interviewed noticed an increase in reusable bag use. All merchants said that there had been minimal disruption from the transition to reusable bags. No merchant said they had suffered financially as a result of the ordinance. For example, the Westport Trader Joe's supervisor stated that although their store borders other towns, They've not seen any drop in business since the law was passed three years ago. In other words, from people going to the Trader Joe's and the other town that had uh, plastic bags. And then city officials interviewed in Telluride, Colorado, Westport, Connecticut, and Southampton, New York, confirmed that no citations had been issued to businesses resulting from the passage of the law. So there was no instance when they had to find anyone. That's, that's encouraging. I found that anecdotally just around town. I, I haven't found anyone, maybe I've been talking to the wrong people, I haven't found anyone who's really opposed to this. Now, I've asked a number of business owners like, where I do business, and it could be I'm misrepresenting, and I don't mean to be, but in my personal experience, I people have seemed to be pretty good with this. You know. And I don't know if you guys are made aware, I saw it only on Facebook, but the New Paltz Chamber of Commerce is going to poll their members on what they think about a plastic band bag. Mm -hmm. I saw that about a week or two ago. Where did you see that? It was on the New Paltz Chamber of Commerce Facebook page. I actually spoke with the, the president about this a while back, kind of what his thoughts and his, you know, thoughts immediately were positive, but he wanted to kind of talk about it a bit more. I guess we'll see what comes of that. Well, I was uh, quoted in a, a local weekly paper as saying that the Chamber of Commerce was opposed, and, and actually that I went back to the video, and it's not what I said, but they actually called me a complaint that I had characterize that as, as being opposed. Mm. Um, so I, I took that as a real encouraging sign. So thank you, Chamber of Commerce. We, we appreciate it. And uh, it's like we live in the right town. Um, so everyone I think who wants to speak on this had a chance to speak. Um, tomorrow will be a, uh, a village board meeting, actually a village meeting, a village in town. And uh, we are on the, on the, on the uh, agenda to come and make some recommendations. Uh, at least I believe us to be. And that will not be here. Right. That will, that will be here. Yeah, you can ask straight, yes. Dan, I have a question. You had mentioned yeah. that you felt it would be a good idea for the town and village to take this on at the same time. Yeah. Is there any movement on the town side? I've informally mentioned it to my colleagues uh, to mixed review, but not more than just casual conversation. Uh, the supervisor was a county legislator when this was brought up from before the entire county. Uh, that resolution did not pass. I don't know how she voted on it back then. Um, so I'm, I'm not sure. I, I can tell you that I'm generally very supportive of it. But you know, I have four other colleagues. Good. All right, um, let's get to move on with our agenda. Um, Mike, go back over here. Thanks. So we have a. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your input. Great. All right. So we have some uh, homework to look at. Uh, thank you very much for the for the information Thanks. and education. Thank you. Let's uh, let's turn to the wall kill. And uh, we have a uh, a guest with us tonight. Uh, thank you again, uh, Ms. Jennifer Epstein from uh, Riverkeeper, and. Um, so we've been talking for a couple of meetings now about the wall kill, uh, spurred on, I guess, initiated by some of the testing and reporting done by Riverkeeper. Um, just to quickly frame the issue, uh, the wall kill is hurting uh, pretty much for much of its, its length. 
the citizen testing that's been done has shown that some of the worst um, worst locations in terms of fecal bacteria, poops, has been in the, the four locations in, uh, in New Paltz. And uh, this commission is recommending the uh, placement of signage at the Walking River, at the boat launches, and at places where the, uh, where the river is entered. Uh, what was discussed at the last village meeting, and I'll catch you up in this, is would be to put down at the Walk Hill a uh, URL that would lead people to a detailed poster prepared by Riverkeeper, which, we, which would be hosted on the village website. So it would not be something created, the document would be created by Riverkeeper, but hosted by the village of New Paltz. And rather than trying to get all this information on a little sign, uh, we figured it would be effective if we gave people a means to look at the detail before they put their boat in the water, or maybe when they got out of the river, or maybe when they went home. But trying to fit everything on a little sign, or putting a big sign with all sorts of detail down there, it just seemed uh, that putting a URL uh, that people could go to, and having that URL linked on the village site would be an effective way to say the village is putting this information out there. We didn't do the work, but, but here it is. Um, so, uh, Jennifer, I, I appreciate you, uh, you coming here and your support of, of this effort uh, all along. Um, tell us a little bit about, you know, we've, we've seen the numbers and I guess seen the posters, but if you would just summarize what, uh, what your organization is doing and what you found in New Pulse, that would probably be, be helpful. So, River Keeper has been coordinating a citizen sampling program in the Walco watershed since 2012. And this is one of Currently, we have six um, citizen sampling programs in tributary watersheds of the Hudson River. So we sample on the Catskill Creek, the Esopus Creek, the Rondeau Creek, the Walco Rivers, the Canico River, and the Spark Hill River. Um, we test for Enterococcus, which is a type of bacteria that lives in the guts of warm-blooded animals. and where it is found in very large quantities in the water, it is an indication that there's been some type of fecal contamination. So where you see Enterococcus, you still need to do some work to figure out what the source of that Enterococcus was. Was it wildlife? Was it waterfowl? Was it human? If human, was it from a sewer system? Was it from a septic system? Um, so it's not a a perfect indicator of a failing sewer infrastructure, but it is approved by the EPA and recommended by the EPA as an indicator of fecal contamination to be used in assessing waters for their safety for recreation. So the standard that we apply um, in our communications and in our analysis of our, our data is recommended by the EPA and New York State is right now in the process of reviewing their water quality standards and we believe that they're going to adopt the standard recommended by the EPA, which is 60 enterococcus cells per milliliter, 100 milliliters of water is the cutoff. Above that, the beach should be closed for swimming until a sample, a clean sample is obtained. Um, below 60 and the water is deemed to be suitable for swimming. So this standard is a primary, it's what call, it was called a primary contact standard. Primary contact means contact where you are likely to ingest water. Um, there's been some misconception among people who've heard about our data that, oh my gosh, I can't touch the wall kill, you know, I can't let my dog swim in the walk hill, I can't wade in the walk hill, I can't fish in the walk hill. It's, this standard is to do with swimming, or paddle boarding, or wading, your children playing in the water, things where you're going to get the water in your face and ingest it. So that's important to, to take into account. Um, so like I said, we're, we're currently coordinating citizen sampling in six watersheds. The latest data analysis that we've done is for data from 2012 to 2013. So that's 12 samples. We sample once per month from May to October. 
and we found that the wall kill fails the EPA recommended guideline 86% of the times we tested. That's for the tributary overall. In New Paltz, we have four sampling sites, as Don mentioned. Two are at the bolt launches, and the other two are in two tributaries. The Sawmill Brook that comes out of SUNY New Paltz through some residential areas and joins the wall kill at the Sojourner Truth boat launch. And then a small tributary, it's unnamed, that comes, from what I know of it, out of a pretty big wetland area past the Stewart's. Preserve. That's the that's tributary 13. Okay. Yeah, so Earl tributary 13, 13. <laughs> um, is our fourth site. Mm -hmm. And um, it's actually a pretty little spot behind Stewart's you would never expect. Yeah. It's beautiful. Yeah. Um, so those are the four sites where we sample. I've been talking to Don about these signs, which River Keeper thinks is a, a great idea. We, we really support the idea of public education. But the problem <laughs> with the, the language has been how to thread the needle between providing enough information that it's factually accurate and that it's not going to simply alarm people. Um, to have thread the needle between that and too much information to fit on a small well, side. The organization has been very, very careful and very, very responsible about we will say this and we will not say more. You know, right. This is what we know, this is the data, right. and not doing too much interpretation. We really try to let the data speak for itself. The other point to be made is that we don't have the authority or, or the 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 liberty to declare water safe or unsafe for swimming. That's the job of the Department of Health. Um, the Department of Health does not test on the Wallkill River because these are not official beaches. These are water access points, but these are not beaches. Nonetheless, they are, this, this waterway in this area is designated as a, a waterway to be used for recreation. So we feel it's fair to apply the standard I've talked to enough people who want to get in <laughs> that I know that the, the desire for the information is there and the desire for the clean water is there. Um, so we, you know, we, we can't say this is safe or unsafe. We don't have the authority, we don't sample frequently enough, but we do want people to know that there's a lack of information, there's not testing being done, and we're trying to fill that gap the best we can. And, and get the conversation started. And part of the concerns that we've talked about is having this signage point to the correct contact people. Um, we've got great information, we can provide great information, but we really want people in New Paltz to talk to leaders in New Paltz about it, not just to come to us, and, and or to think that our sampling program is, is the end of the story, is the solution. We want to really generate more conversation locally. I'm, I'm very curious, I mean, if you were just to take this as, say, the first step, um, and then you say, okay, well, let's, we've got this contamination, what's the next step? How do we determine what the source is of the bacteria? What tests do you recommend that we buy? We've done testing on tributary 13. I have, I've had students do testing on it, um, and there's a test kit that we, we got from, that we had the DPW order. Mm -hmm. um, in test, I think we were testing for E. coli. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm curious as to what that, that's one question. Then the, tw the testing that you did on the tributaries, how far up were you testing? Were you testing at the wall kill itself or were you testing further up on the tributary? Or do you have like. So on tributary, tr on tributary 13, we're testing at Stewart's. Okay, so that's b b well before it goes into Gets the, to the wall, to the wall, wall kill. kill. And, you, and there it tested positive. Wow, because that was 100%. I believe yeah. that stream has failed our, the, has failed the standard 100% of the time. For the time so that's involved. very interesting, because that stream um, travels through an extensive, wetland. several hundred acre wetland. Right. So if it's still contaminated at that point, then I would wonder, like, what, how would you do, how would you recommend doing some kind of a point source testing because at that point you don't know at what point on the tributary this, this contaminant is going into it because mm -hmm. there's so many houses along the way, there's so many septic systems, there's so many different possible 
places it could get contaminated. It comes in from, it, comes, it starts out coming in under the throughway and it branches off into many different, different streams. Mm -hmm. And I'm just, I'm curious as to how, what, what the next step what would you recommend if we were to take on something like this and say, hey, we want to find out. Yeah. So some ideas are to do DNA testing. Um, you can use more indicators than just Enterococcus. There are different species of bacteria that are associated with different sources of bacteria. So for instance, um, we're talking about a wetland complex, mm -hmm. which probably waterfowl in it. And oh, deer. absolutely. And so you can look for species of bacteria that are associated with deer and waterfowl, and you can compare the abundance of those to the abundance of, of bacteria species that are associated with humans. Um, another idea would be to do a more thorough analysis of these sub-watersheds and the land use in them and the potential inputs. Um, what sort of, is there a test kit, is there a, how, how would one get a hold of this? Would The DNA tests mm -hmm. are, um, there are commercial companies that will do them, they're very expensive. <laughs> I'm not going to, I'm not going to lie to you, they're really expensive. Um, it's not something that a citizen group can just go out in the field and do. What about the college? Somebody at the college may be able to, yeah, there are certainly biology and ecology professors who have the equipment and expertise to do these types of analyses. I, I don't know of specific people who can do exactly what you're looking for, but it would certainly be a good starting point to, to ask around and see if there are people who could help to investigate. Um, so as far as a more thorough watershed analysis goes, if you do have septics in, in the watershed, um, testing those areas, inspecting those systems. Um, that's a way to, to see if they're a problem. Um, I think in the more built up sections of New Falls where there's sewerage, there are sewer lines, um, to look at the known problem areas in the sewer system, you know, to, to get information from the wastewater plant operators and find out where the problem areas are in the delivery infrastructure to begin trying to address those um, and to um, what was I going to say? Oh, yeah. Also looking at ages of parcels can be informative to, to spotlight parts of the infrastructure that are older and probably more prone to, to problems due to age and, and mm -hmm. just general decay. So those aren't so much, those last few aren't so much source tracking. Those aren't so much which mm -hmm. source do we have, but those are um, uh, assuming really that our wastewater infrastructure would be a problem area. Well, there's a substation just upstream, you know, when you, uh, on Henry W., um, just across the street from the housing development from Village, what's it called now? Colonial Village Gardens. Colonial. It used to be Colonial Arms Housing. Just across the street from there, there's a substation, and it stinks to high heaven. It stinks all the time, not just when it's raining. I, I really feel sorry for people who live right, right near it. Um, but it's, it's like sort of glaring, obvious spot right there. I mean, I don't know if there's any way we could, what, what options we have for maybe. So that's another idea, you know, another idea ahead of the DNA is just, it's more concentrated testing. So more, you know, we've got four sites, I, I just keep looking at this map, I'm sorry, but, uh -huh. you know, I'm just thinking it through. But um, testing in more places more frequently for a period of time to see how the numbers fluctuate over the short term and in response to rainfall, and how the numbers look in these known problem areas, um, and then inspecting the infrastructure itself. I don't know when the last time that 
New Paltz did a, um, a wastewater infrastructure inventory and survey was, but survey of the sanitary system to document and locate the known problem spots would probably be a huge step. And I have been in uh, conversation with a uh, New Paltz resident who is a uh, wastewater treatment plant operator in Manhattan. Um, and his suggestions were just the same as yours, pretty much. We need to do advanced testing. It's, it's expensive, he said, but we need to determine whether the source is agricultural runoff, whether it's from wastewater plants, whether it's from, you know, from all the various sources we, we you've mentioned. There are tests to identify. We, we need to take an inventory of what's in the water, and then we'll know where it came from to some degree, and then we can know where to look. But I think the testing of some of this advanced and expensive nature is, is the obvious next step. Because we know there's a problem, now we need to pull that problem apart and see what its component parts are. And that would be the, the I think, the obvious and expensive next step. And your group's not going to be able to afford it. No. I think a, a municipality, hopefully with some grants and with some help from other entities, would probably be the way to do that. Um, yeah, Dan has talked about it in your municipal council. Because the other thing to mention is that as Don said in, in the intro, the wall kills hurting, and it's not just here. So we see very high enterococcus counts all the way to the state line, for example. They actually drop a little bit at the state line, so you, people love to point one up in Jersey. Block, but it's not that simple. Um, but So it seems that there is contamination coming from upstream, but from the work that we've done in the tributaries, these two little tributaries, tributary 13 and Salmon Brook, there's also contamination within New Paul. So while the upstream considerations are important, it, it can't simply be you know, shrugged off as just that. But um, Well, we'd like to swim in the upstream as well. I mean, at least we should be able to do that. And we can't really do too much about what comes from New Jersey into the wall kill, but we ought to be able to do something about our own tributaries. I agree. We need to start locally and then, then Work, work out from there. So, in the meantime, while we're talking about what can be done to clean it up, if we're talking about signage, um, I'm just going to say from my perspective, I don't think that a sign with just a URL is truly going to educate much of the public. And just as people that I know and myself, if I was going to swim in a body of water and I saw just a sign with the URL, I would jump in the water and go home. And that would be, you know, like, I just think that, and I will admit that I was not a fan of the wording suggested by Riverkeeper because I felt like it was too much jargon for the, you know, common person that just wants to go swimming. I think that that is a better option than just a URL. I just am concerned that people wouldn't, you know, they're in their bathing suits or they're there to do whatever they're going to do. They're not taking out their iPhones to look up the website to look up the fecal matter in the river. So I just think that something that people can see when they go, whether it's, you know, something just a few words, you know, even if it's jargony and I hate to say it, but just something that people can read before they go in the water that isn't going to be a commitment to go Google something. And I, 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 I explained that poorly, so I, I agree with you. Um, I have to go back and look at my notes from the meeting, but it was something short, like the Wallkill River may not be safe. Okay, so was it yeah, just the URL? Yeah, no, yeah, no, oh, okay. I actually that word. I'm in favor then. Well, I have, I, oh, go ahead. I was going to say a quick fix. I heard um, Jen mention uh, the word ingest, the primary contact refers to ingestion. Could we use the original language that Jen had suggested and substitute primary contact with ingest or ingestion? I think that's a little bit more clear to the common person. And well, it's, it's more accurate. I, I, until you explained at this meeting, uh, thought that, that jumping to the wall kill and, and waiting in there would, would give me rashes or something. So mm -hmm. yeah, that might be a good, uh, a good clarification to... Uh, all right, and then if we have that language and then the URL. Yeah, I think the idea of having a URL is great. My concern was the idea that it would just be a sign yeah. with the URL. Yeah, I, I share that concern. So. All right, um, so the larger, more detailed poster from Riverkeeper has been with the attorney uh, just for a month since the last village meeting. 
Um, and I checked for an update last week and also yesterday and today. We haven't had any word from the attorney as of yet. So <clears throat> let's hope we'll have that for the next meeting. And I think since it was up, something that, that Riverkeeper put a lot of care and in, in investigation into, I, I, I don't expect there'll be major problems. But we haven't had the blessing yet, so we can't officially recommend it to the village board to do that tomorrow night. But hopefully, the next meeting we can. So. And then, if he does approve that or she does approve that, um, I'll finalize take the draft off and can send you the PDF for, for reproduction. Great. Okay. I think that it, we changed the, um, we used to use a third color for a more uh, a higher um, level of enterococcus concentration. There's a, a still further standard of 110 bacteria per 100 mils of water. But um, we decided that it was too complicated to have three colors, so we just, we, we now use two, red and green. So it may look a little different once I revise, but it's the same data, it's the same. And is it characterizing your results Accurately to say, you mentioned this this number of sixty, this level of sixty, mm -hmm. which was you know above this, it's it's not not safe. It was sixty parts per what? What was that again? It's sixty enterococcus cells per hundred mils of water. So your testing found that the new pulp sites uh, failed a hundred percent of the time, except in a couple of very cold winter months. No, so we sampled from May to October. Okay. Uh, that's the recreational season, so we don't sample when people are not typically getting in the water. And I'm, I've got the data in front of me, so I'm just going to give you the, Thank you the correct information here. So the Plains Road boat launch failed the standard 83% of the times we sampled. These, then that's the Sojourner Truth. The Springtown Road boat launch failed 92% of the times. The stream at Stewart's was 91%. The Salmo Brook is 100%. Yeah, I had those first, sorry about that. So across the board, very, very high failure rates. I appreciate rates. the clarification because yeah. I have exaggerated it. The fourth one is Sawmill Brook. That's also a little, as uh, a tributary. That and that one too uh, goes through the Harcourt. That's the one that goes through the Harcourt, correct? The bird sanctuary behind the gardens for nutrition? It goes, it, it goes from the SUNY campus down through oh. a residential development and then down along the rail trail. And it's actually, again, it's, it's a pretty nice little watershed. It's got a nice little floodplain. There are some homes that are built up close to it, but not um, very many. Um, and so it's, it's sort of a mystery as well. I mean, we would very much love to see more investigation of all of these sites to, to really crack the question of where is this contamination coming from? Why are those numbers so high? Well, I think that's the next logical step. If you put a sign up, hopefully people will become curious and then angry and force their representatives to do something. That's the, that's the theory, anyway. So let's get it done. Can Thank I you. just ask again, where is that for? for? Sawmill Brook Tributary. It, joins the walk hill at the Sojourner Truth and Boat Launch. Okay. It begins in, at the, the SUNY campus, in, in the Gums. The ponds, the Gums. <laughs> yeah, I know, yeah. Um, it's different from the Platagel Creek, which yeah. comes across. So you know where the cows are? No. That one goes by SUNY too. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for all your, your health sure, information no and, and uh, you look forward to uh, continuing to work with I'm always around. I have cards, so I'm going to leave a stack of those if anybody wants to get in touch and continue the conversation. And for anyone who just tuned in, this is Jennifer Epstein from Riverkeeper, the citizen group who has been doing the testing of the Walk Hill River and right. many other. Many other bodies of water in, uh, in Lower New York. Thank you. Thanks. Um, okay. So we're going to uh, turn to solar street lighting.
So. presentation for the uh, September 10th Village Board meeting. If that's what the Village Board wants, and I'm not 100% clear that that's what Jason wants, but I do have somebody from a local solar company, um, Prism Solar, which is actually right in Highland, so I mean, it's very local, it's Ulster County, um, that is willing to come speak. Um, I think that we also, I know that he's not here, but Jason is very interested in uh, solar panel street lighting, but I really think that we also need to look at LED as an option. Um, just when we're considering all the options, because you know it's not totally off grid, but there is an environmental benefit and there's a huge economic benefit. Um, I think they were saying like 80% of the electricity bill would, you know, be cut just from switching to LED. So I think that it's really just something that we should be presenting both options, you know. And so I'm just not sure, I don't know if you're clear on what, I, like I said, I have somebody that's willing and able to present on the 10th. I just don't know if that's what they want. I think I got back from uh, the mayor that he'll put it on the agenda. Okay. He just wanted to know with one presentation or two and trying to figure out how many people to, or how much time to set aside. So should I, I like I said, Prism Solar was happy to come and talk to us about those. He said we have two options. Um, I wasn't able to grab my laptop, but I have them by email. Um, basically, one is completely off-grid and one is a little less off-grid, um, was basically the way that it was presented. Um, but I have more detail, I can share that. Um, so I don't know if you just want me to invite solar panel uh, information or LED as well. I don't know how he feels about two presentations, if we just should just stick to the one and then we can personally share with them what we learned about LED. You should do both. I mean, if you had LED and solar, <laughs> I mean, LEDs, it's so much more efficient, you would need less solar panels. Much less purchasing on the be on behalf, or for the village. Uh, if we were to, if the village was to choose solar panels, uh, thousands of dollars each versus hundreds of dollars each to switch to solar panel, or to switch to LED. I, that was my inclination too, but give the village board all the options and let them let them so sort through. So I'm going to find uh, somebody locally to speak about LED so that both the benefits of each can be presented and there we go. We were just talking about you, sir. Oh, yeah. um, well, we were talking about the uh, the September, the first September meeting of the village board and presentations from solar light um, providers um, and also a presentation on uh, the LED light option. We weren't sure if we were comfortable with, with two presentations. Uh, uh, three public hearings that night. On September 10th? No, uh, this is September 8th, something like that. Um, Would you want to do one one meeting and one the next meeting? The LED lighting. As an alternative option to solar panels. Yeah, why don't we do them in two different meetings? That's right. Okay, okay. there you good. go. What is the second meeting in September? Do you know what it is? Um, I can look it up, I'm sure, on the website. Second and fourth, is it? Second and fourth Wednesdays? Second and fourth Wednesdays. Yeah. All right. Okay. I have uh, put in, uh, at this point, four calls to the uh, gentleman in Downers Grove, Illinois, where they have a solar light program in place for a while. No, guy doesn't answer his phone, doesn't return calls. <laughs> um, I know, I mean, I've talked to people in the department, this is the guy you talk to, but the guy doesn't return calls, so uh, I'll... Uh, Call 17 times one day and hope I can get them or something. I don't know. At the moment, I've got uh, nothing on that. So thank you for uh, for doing the research and getting that squared away. And, and just because so. there's one other thing, um, I don't. Last time it was brought up that we might already have some LED street lights, and I was asked to see. And I'm waiting to hear back from Central Hudson, but it, it does seem like they're going to talk to me. They just needed to get me hooked up with okay. the right person. Um, who else would know that? Um, no, the Department of Public Works doesn't do street lights, do they? Yeah, okay. Yeah. Yeah. So I have a call out. Hopefully they return calls. They <laughs> seem to be, I mean, they seem good. Okay. Can you ask something? Sure. So, it seems to me these two topics are very related. So, having two different presentations, 
right? Because you can have solar street lights that are LED, correct? Or are they completely separate yeah. options? I mean, I'll admit. LED solar street lights. So I'm wondering if you really want it to come twice or if it's going to be repeating. But can you also have LED that's not solar? Right. So the way that the way that I understand it is that you can have solar LED, and LED solar, which is totally off grid. Right. And we would need all new equipment, right. everything, which, like I said, would be thousands of dollars per unit, um, 300 street lights, thousands of dollars each. Or you could still be on grid and have LED lights in the existing equipment, which would only be a couple hundred dollars per unit, but would save, like I said, up to 80% of the um, what we're paying. So, I mean, it's just two different options that in my phone calls initially was what I was hearing from a lot of people was, well, that is an option in solar panel tree. Like, have you guys also thought about LED? Was sort of the response that I was getting from almost everybody. It's just that it's two different options, one being totally off-grid and one not being off-grid. The goal is to reduce the cost and to increase the, the efficiency of the street lighting. So then it would not be, it would be foolish to leave out the LED option because right. it's less, ex, you know, it's less expensive right. and it's more efficient. You know, if you think about it, I don't know, I, I, think, I think you'd have to provide both options. It's not, we're just getting solar panels on the streetlights just to get solar panels on right. the streetlights. I think it's really important just to consider both, and I know I asked last meeting, is the goal to save the money or to be off grid, and you said both. Um, so that's why I just think it's important to have all the information about all of the options. Yeah, I'm just saying that, yeah, that practically say. speaking, yeah, if this guy is going to come, he doesn't do LED lighting. Oh, I'm sorry. Right, he see. doesn't. So it's two different. Right, it's two different. Okay. Yeah. So Dan, you had something. This may be overwhelming us all, but two joint meetings ago, we had a discussion on solar panels, and I was asked because I said I had been in contact with some people, various solar panel projects to have them come in to do a joint presentation. What ended up happening was we canceled the next joint meeting. This one coming up is at Huguenot Street, and I think it was appropriate to do it there because it's a different location. We can't get as many people there. So we had hoped to do it for the September joint meeting to have a discussion very similar to this. So I don't know if that's maybe too much on the agenda, but if we're going to have a similar conversation, we maybe want to tee it up all for one night and really just knock ourselves out. Well, the village board's going to be there. And the town's we'll going to be there as a bonus. Well, you, you can just request to be in the joint agenda. And we can request that from okay. the village clerk. Okay. Uh, I think the next one would be a, a town one, right? So the September meeting would be, uh, would be yeah, would be um, Roseanne. What am I asking, Roseanne? If, uh, to schedule that presentation. Okay. Schedule the solar presentation so, there rather than the village meeting. Do we want to schedule both for that meeting? You know, I'm, I'm not sure what we would have a presentation on LED, what that would be about. It's simply a, a, a bulb option. Well, that's, I don't and know if it's something that we can just research the numbers on and present that to ourselves and say this is what the numbers would be, or if that's something where we want to have a company, you know, a representative give that. Maybe Central Hudson can just do that. Well, that's the other thing, too, is, is these are, <coughs> we don't own the street lights, we pay rent to Central Hudson, mm -hmm. we pay the budget for them. So if they're all switched out, you know, one that, you know, is Central Hudson going to pass those things on to the village? One thing. You mean if you went LED? If we bought the LED, there's nothing keeping Central Hudson from charging us the exact same amount of rent for the electricity. Um, if they use less money. electricity, they can't charge us the same price. Unless they're not building us on the pilot. They're not charging us for the electricity, but it's just a flat rate. Just a flat rate. Oh, I see. It, was, that it could be a rent and, and electricity. It could, we'd it have to see what the fee structure is. The only thing people would know that, that would be part of their them. presentation, probably. And when I do speak to them, that's something that I want to know is are we currently paying a flat rate or are we paying for the usage? Right. And I mean, if the treasurer were here, or they would. You could, you, I mean, we would just find that out tomorrow. Right. We need to ask them that. Uh, Jason, we are currently negotiating with Central Hudson as far as running a pipeline straight down this building for uh, gas to get information. Yeah. Is this something that we might be able to negotiate with them to have them provide as far as, you know, 
aside from just giving us money to switch over from oil to gas in the building, yeah. and push them for more, given that we're really conceding to bringing in fracking gas. Uh, uh, well, you both work on it in parallel. So are you suggesting that we ask them for the solar, or for the LED? I'm suggesting that we push them for everything that we can get from them. We're going to let them bring in fracking gas in our village. That's what I'm suggesting. I think we should try to stop them from doing that. Sir? I think we should try to stop that. I think that should be stopped. I can't believe we're actually doing that. It's horrible. It's just a horrible legacy. It's a really foolish decision. You know, I have to say the last village board meeting was my first board meeting, and I was really kind of shocked at how uh, little resistance that Central Hudson was now like the That's because the meeting wasn't publicized at all. And it was also at the very, very end of the meeting after everybody else was mm -hmm. Nobody knew about it. Not even, some of the board members didn't even know that they were coming to that meeting to give a presentation. So yeah, yeah that's I, why I, there wasn't I any opposition. The board meeting, so why are they even here? Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. no, it was someone yeah. couldn't remember. It wasn't because of some nefarious. Oh, no, I don't think anyone's accusing anyone of nefarious. Oh, I'm always well. accusing people of nefarious things. <laughs> so, Jason, you go you on your track and see if you can get some there negotiating. And, Joanna, you ask the question when you talk to them and if they have a return to call. And uh, we'll, try to, we'll try to figure it. out what the difference would be in cost if we switched from the current light bulbs to LED. So for right now, we're only looking at one presentation? We're looking at one presentation With for the solar next yeah, solar panels for the next meeting, and hopefully in, within a week we'll have enough information to decide whether it's a presentation or just information on numbers with regard to LEDs. So then to clarify what you just said, we want it for the next meeting, not for the one that's going to be joined? Okay. We had spoken about the solar panels being at the next, in conjunction with what right, Dan said, the at the, at, and I may, may it be the next, at the joint meeting that okay, Dan referenced. Okay, so the next joint meeting. When the solar yes. issue was to be discussed. Okay. LED, we'll leave that up in the air uh, until you get some information from Central Hudson, and based on that, well, we can make a decision offline and make a recommendation to whoever's conducting whatever meeting it is on whether to have a presentation on LEDs <laughs> at that time, whatever it might be. <clears throat> okay, and then we've nailed that down. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so uh, let's move on to the plastic, move back to the plastic bag ban. Uh, um, the agenda says discussion of public comment, and uh, it was, the comment was interesting. It was good. It was pretty much one-sided. Um, I think it's fair because this meeting was publicized, several letters to the editor, you know, a press release, yeah, it's been on the Facebook page uh, all day, and uh, it was on the front page of the, of the Freeman today. Um, yeah, the fact that there's no opposition sitting here, or voiced, is something that I, yeah, I take as significant, I, mm -hmm. I, you know, and I'm going to interpret from that, that um, there is no strong or vocal opposition from the business community, or from the community at large to this, this plan, and if I've got that wrong, prove me wrong somebody out there, because we're figuring that people are happy uh, with the proposed uh, ban. So um, we've given them the language from Larchmont, and we've told them the only difference between the various five or six communities that have done this is who enforces it, um, and that's something that New Post will have to figure out at the board level. But I think we have given them the proposed law. As of tomorrow, we'll say we had our our public uh, comment session, and based on that, we would like to suggest they do it. Don, just so you know, you're, you're now on the end of the forums. You're on yeah. public access. Okay. Uh, I didn't get anything for, I don't believe I got anything for the environmental cost. I think... Uh, Except for the, the presentation request. Okay. Well, I will... Um, and we can add you tomorrow. You know, I, I think we had asked at the last meeting. Uh, at the last village board meeting, just during the discussion, that we'd come back in a month and, oh, and, exactly. and I don't think there was a formal request made beyond that discussion at the meeting. Okay. Um, so I will uh, I will request that when I get home. And uh, commission members are, are welcome to attend if you can want to. You know, it's not no obligation. I'm just going to tell them yes, we we suggest this. Um, let me just make this note to myself so I... Thank you for the markers.
too. Okay, municipal solid waste pickup. Um, I was invited to a meeting with uh, the mayor, <coughs> the uh, blue terminator from the Department of Public Works, uh, Laura Pettis for the recycling co uh, coordinator, and we sat down and, and talked about the uh, practicalities of looking at municipal solid waste. One of the uh, big advantages from the towns that we've all talked to, and Jason's talked a lot to Kingston and Waterloo. I had one conversation with Waterloo. Uh, one of the biggest uh, benefits they've seen is having control of the waste stream and being able to say, hey, you can't throw that away anymore. This needs to be handled this way. Um, the private haulers, especially when it comes to commercial accounts, they're going to take what's ever in the dumpster. I mean, as a general rule, I'm not disparaging any private hauler, but they don't sort through it. They don't look through it. And one of the things that will need to happen as a way of putting this plan into place, if we, if we do it, is to, number one, have a, a trash audit. Sounds nice. It means that people need to physically get into three days worth of commercial trash a sample and three days worth of residential trash and find out what's in the trash, what people are throwing away. It's going to be a fun job, and I nominate all of you. I'll be away that week, uh, whatever that week is. <laughs> uh, but uh, we, within, from the room uh, of the four people there, I think we had three people who are willing to do it. We're going to need probably to get a dozen people together over a number of, of days to pick through trash and, and audit it and find out what people are throwing away and what's in the trash. So we'll know <laughs> what sort of equipment and what we're going to need to deal with if we take it over as a municipality. And uh, I, uh, I'm wondering if we might work with the courts to see if there might be some way to get people time off jail sentences. <laughs> 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 that's the only way we're going to get a But uh, anyway, that's something that's in our future uh, to yeah. discuss and plan for is uh, picking through the trash. Free lunch, I would consider it. Would you want free lunch? Yeah, I'm not going to shower. Yeah. Yeah. So, have you ever been to the, to the, to the dump where they do I not want to really um, the smell is overwhelming well I was just thinking um, that like when our garbage can piles up I get like nauseous and start gagging so multiply I that by I 10 yeah, a, yeah. Yeah. Um, and during the course of the meeting we went through some uh, some of the numbers and some of the uh, some of the costs and things and um, it still remains to be they still need to work that work a little bit more to see what the economics are. I think they're, you know, we're, we're just trying to figure out how much and what sort of savings there might be and, and what the cost would be. Um, I think it's fair to say we're going to need to use some imagination and be a little creative, try and keep the cost down in some way to make this, uh, make this workable. But we've had one meeting and uh, I think there'll be more to follow. So that's a work in progress. What happens to the RFP for a... Uh one year's worth of a single private hauler to at least cut down on all the um, exhaust and fumes and multiple truck drivings all over the village because we have Was so that many companies. Was RFP issued? Did that go out? Yeah, and uh, nobody responded because there wasn't enough information provided. They won't pay, the haulers need to know how many things there are, what the If something came out in terms of some kind of a law, wouldn't would the law supersede the con the private contracts? Well, there'd sure be a lawsuit to or ten to figure that out. Right. Yeah. So, uh, so the R RFP is stalled. Uh, it went out, but the haulers required other information, and, and there were issues with. Uh, I guess it needs to be adjusted if we're going to get a different result. Well, and there's also concern about about legal ramifications. That's interesting. I mean, what about when you switch to municipal pickup? Wouldn't people have contracts with their private haulers? 
And I would imagine, yeah, you know, grandfathering it. That's the scenario that John was talking about. Uh, an RFP is just, there's no law behind it, but we would have to pass local laws to establish a garbage district or whatever we, you know, whatever we want to do, there would be things in the which might supersede these contracts. And if it were municipal, couldn't you just wait until a resident ended their contract and yeah, then begin exactly. to pick up with those presents? And so know. within a year, we'll have everybody right. up and running. And I would imagine it wouldn't be a two-month ramp-up period to make the switch. We, it would probably take six, eight, month, ten months, yeah. a year to get that program in place. Um, and uh, does anyone know? Are there? Can you can you purchase? I guess you can purchase use uh, garbage trucks there, right there, just like anything else. Yeah. Okay, because because the idea was it would take three trash. Uh, garbage trucks to make this happen, two for primary use and one as a backup, and they're expensive. They're 300 grand a piece. So, you know, if there's a way to, to kind of keep the cost down, at least with the backup, I was thinking that might be a, a way to do it. So now, Don, going back to the trash audit, the purpose of that is to say if people are throwing out, you know, food and food related waste, that's one set of equipment we would need. If people are throwing out food and VCRs, we need, that's a different, what does what the trash audit accomplish? Uh, as I understand it, it would be to um, analyze how much of what is going out in the trash would really still be going out in the trash if there was some control over it, uh, how much we would need to provide for recycling of this, how much we need to provide for recycling of that, just to figure out what, as we would move to a municipal system, what would we, if we were to do a, a more thorough job than a private hauler, what would we need? Just, to, just, just an audit, just to literally find out what's what's in there. And um, I would imagine that um, someone somewhere knows what's in the trash. If it's not just at the landfill the landfill level, but I don't see a lot of analysis by uh, by uh, county waste. In terms of what's in the what what's in the stuff they pick up, so we need to do that research ourselves. And, and then, so then, once you know what's in the trash, what changes as a result of, of the knowing? Well, the biggest thing is that if we have a statistically significant number of things we're collecting from, you should be able to then extrapolate that to how much total garbage is produced by the community. By the so I have numbers in those reports that are just based on the DEC average of 4.34 pounds per person per day. Um, but, you know, the village could be 5 pounds per person per day, it could be 3.5 pounds per person per day, we don't know. And we also only have averages for the breakdown of what's in it. So we know uh, statewide the, the percentage of food waste, or organics, because you can include the yard waste and things like that. Um, compostables, Recyclables and trash. So it's, we know the statewide average, but we don't know what the local percentages are. So it's just to get it's kind of to get more accurate numbers on what the, the village specifically produces. The problem is this: what, what figuring out what a statistically significant percentage uh, number is, because communities much larger than ours use I think a hundred. No, I'm just making these numbers up now. I don't know, um, but we don't know how many. Houses we have to sample. Uh, yeah, and, and an audit, because you're not a microphone by it, an audit would consist, would look at how much trash, how, much, how many biodegradables, and how many recyclables are in the trash. So we then know what sort of equipment and, and mm -hmm. procedures we would need to put in place. Sounds like a hoot. Um, and the, the numbers that have been cited right now are state averages. So we would need to go into our actual New Pulse trash and see what the real world is to be able to try to figure out the numbers and, and buy equipment and stuff. So uh, um, now there's been an item on the uh, on the on the agenda. I guess a comeback. That's something we might want to speak about at some point. And uh, why don't we try to figure out to have a, a a real conversation about it at our next meeting? It's the concept of environmental standard operating procedures and policies for the Department of Public Works. I would very much like to. Um, have communication and input from the department, or at least let them know we're going to have that conversation before we have it, mm -hmm. um, because 
there's, you know, you can really get things off to a bad start if you're an outside group saying, we're going to have a meeting and tell you how to do your job, and we'll get back to you and tell you how to do that when we're done. Just having that conversation at all is something would be a major breakthrough for the village. Okay, well, we'll uh, put it on the agenda for discussion next uh, next meeting uh, offline. I'll, I'll speak with uh, whoever I can and see if anyone would like to join that uh, discussion or what sort of... Uh, what sort of enthusiasm there would be. I'm very interested in that. Okay. Well, that's why it's, that's why it's left on there. Um, so in place of what was on the next written, uh, written item on the agenda, we're going to look to uh, Dan Torres to speak to us a little bit about social media and getting this commission's uh, work communicated more broadly. Well, hello, everybody. Do you want to come Yeah, come on up. <laughs> Well, first of all, I think the, the most important question is, what are you hoping to accomplish with a social media presence? What, what, what is that thing that you're trying to do? Well, we kind of talked about that as a, you know, so I can answer for me. What? For me, I think we want the community to know that we're a body. I mean, we're so new, I feel like so many people don't know that we exist, and until we posted on Facebook twice in the past month and a few um, letters to the editor, I think that there's really not a lot out there saying, here we are, we're actually doing something, you know, join us at meetings or give us your input. So I think that for me, a lot of it is just having people know, A, that we exist, and B, that we are getting things done. To add on to that, you know, when you have an event like we had today with a public comment and we're inviting people in to speak or whatever it might be, that is a time when it's useful to have a uh, social media presence. What my concern is about having a social media presence is now you have this thing, it's Village of New Paltz, EPC, and then people are making comment and there's an expectation to um, return comment or there's, you know, the belief that, okay, is this the official page so that everything that's on that page is the official position of the EPC, in which case we would have to have meetings and agree on the things that went on that Facebook page before any one of us, if say we were all administrators, well, we can't really post as administrators because we haven't discussed it as a group. So what do I want to be able to say this is what we're doing? What do I not want to have something out there that becomes what other new parts sites can become, which sure. are... You know what I'm saying? Hectic, crazy, loud places. You, you, I believe you can. The, the other thing I will say too is that I actually wrote for the town a social media policy that has not been enacted or taken up. Uh, the city of Kingston, I think, is going to take up the policy I wrote though. I gave it to an alderman there who was looking at using it. Mm -hmm. So that's something I can certainly share with you and it's a good jumping off point because it addresses a number of those concerns about if someone posts um, you know, are you speaking for the group? How that happens? Uh, I'm not gonna lie; it's not original content for me. I pulled from like ten other municipalities that mm -hmm. I was able to find online and kind of made one policy that I thought was very good. Um, I kind of assumed when, because I was aware that you guys wanted me to talk about this, that you're looking for awareness of your group as a whole. Obviously, any kind of thing you're doing in regards to events, things like that, and then you're obviously trying to push whatever items you're doing. You're trying to help people live by the values or understand the things that they can do in their own lives that are environmentally conscious too. That was just my assumption. We want to recruit researchers too because we yes. all need to have them. Mm -hmm. And it is, it is something, it is, it is a way of reaching out to sort of the younger community and the community on campus. We had a, um, a several years, I don't know how many years ago this is, maybe six or five years ago. Mm -hmm. The ENCC had a Facebook page, so if you were curious about what happens when you have a Facebook page, all admin you wanted or find it somehow, it's buried in Facebook's indelible archives, um, you can take a look at it and just see what it looked like and what happened and who joined it. Um, and then if you wanted to just take, take you know, update it, I mean, most, of course it's completely out of date because there's a lot of students who are graduated and moved on but you know yeah I mean there's um, certainly a number of good and bad practices I, I run my own like councilman page I have about 1300 likes on it uh, and I get roughly 3,000 views a week on things I post just total of the week that's not unique views there are people who view multiple times um, 
I think it, it, there's a lot of benefit in that because you guys are talking about an issue that really who's going to say, well, I'm anti-environment, right? That That's a pretty popular thing. I think for you guys, the biggest thing that I would suggest is A, setting it up, which is very easy. And if anyone needs help doing that, I'd gladly do it. It takes all of five minutes. Uh, just agreeing on the content that's on there in regards to like your mission statement, mm-hmm. things like that. Yeah. A contact information that's not just the page. That that does happen, I've noticed, where people will contact the page. And because you have multiple administrators, no one kind of answers. So I think having somewhere where you can respond to someone's important. That's just like basic setup kind of stuff. And then from there, I would say just establish what you want it to be about and keep it within the same tone. Uh, there's nothing I think that looks worse than when you can tell there are multiple people using it um, based on the things that are posted and the tone used well, and things like that. You've hit on my uh, one concern about that. I, um, I own two companies, one that makes money and one that doesn't. The one that doesn't <laughs> has four employees and we all have full-time jobs. So we have resisted, or I have resisted, going on to Facebook and Twitter and some of the social media because you need to respond. Mm-hmm. Um, so, uh, and I, I don't have the time, we don't have the time. And I look at this commission in the same way, it's a volunteer part-time thing. And um, so I wonder if it's effective to have some social media that is static, it's just informational, and we could have an email address somewhere, but I really wouldn't want to get into a, a discussion sort of thing where we have to respond to things. And, and, and I just, hear that, but I think that if you did that, it would be as good as not happening. Just based on the way Facebook works, Facebook is an algorithm. So when I post something and people like or comment or something like that, more people will see it. It'll come up in their news feed. That's often why you'll see graphics that'll say, share this if you agree. It's mm-hmm. not done because you necessarily want to see what the message is. It's because that page knows the more people who do it, the more people will see it, the more likes they will get. Right. And especially if they're selling something, that's a great way of doing it. Almost every brand does that, right? Share this, if you, you know, those kind of things. I'll give you this if you were the thousandth share. So to leave a page up there just static on its own would have, uh, I would say, no impact. Well, I think Don is saying we would add things to the page at times. You just wouldn't, it wouldn't be like a constant back and forth. Well, I just, you know, I just, my own experience is if you put something on Facebook, someone might comment, comment or ask, and, or, and if you don't respond for two weeks, that's worse than having no site. Sure. You know, so... Let's ask the secretary. No, what I, do you think? I sent up a page to the Rybeck Animal Hospital, and I thought we set it up so the public could not post on the page. You can do it where you can't post on the page. I'm not so sure about not being able to comment on posts that you post. You can comment, and I, then we could remove the comment. You could always remove the comment, and that's also why I suggest right. passing a policy, because that was one of the issues that I saw with the town's Facebook page is that people were choosing which comments to keep and not keep, and sometimes that to me seemed a little iffy. So if you have yeah. a standard to it, then you can't accuse someone of doing something because they didn't like the person or agree with the topic or something along those lines. You know something on this list? I think there may be a setting that you can choose that allows you to have to approve all comments before they're viewed publicly. Mm-hmm. And if you choose that and just never approve any comments, then you're not giving anybody any favoritism, nothing. But then you've got a static site. Yeah. People so, want so to that's, that's the issue. Like it, it feed into the algorithm, you know, the members of the board can share it, anybody that feels, you know, supporting or yeah. against something can share it. And, and my, my thing is to, to set it up that way, then you should just have a regular website. Because what makes Facebook special and unique is that social engagement. Yeah. And that ability to see something and say, here's what I think, and, and maybe get a response or have somebody else comment underneath it. So if, if the goal is to remove that aspect of it and you solely just want to get information out there, then I would suggest asking the village to just give you a site on their regular website. Well, and maybe somebody or somebody's are willing to, to do the maintenance on that. I just, you know, for me, sure. that's, a, that's yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm not, no, I'm not, so. Uh, but I might be alone on that, so I don't want to, you know, color the conversation. It's, it's one thing that's it's very easy, if I'm on Facebook, to simply say we're having an environmental policy commission, which I've done, or the different things that we've worked on, or I shared links to um, articles that were written about things we were doing. Um, 
that's easy for me to do as myself when I'm logged in myself. However, I log in under a pseudonym because I don't wish to be found by my students. I know um, you are now. Are you? I knew it as you were saying. Yes. Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, <laughs> yes. Yes, I, I knew, knew it the second you said it. Love yeah. me. Yeah. Yeah. So, so that, that, it, that creates a problem where I'm not even necessarily representing myself, and I don't want to represent this group as not representing myself, blah, blah, blah. So it becomes, it becomes an issue of your private versus your public. My teenager had his cat as his Facebook yeah. identity for, uh, for two years. Yeah, and I do have my own page under my own name, but I don't use it. Yes. Interesting. I'm shocked. Yeah, you wouldn't find me near Facebook. No. <laughs> Wait, I remember, Don, you had a Facebook for like a day. It was, it, it was yeah. eight hours. And then you wrote us all an email like, and it said, nope, done. Later. <laughs> <laughs> that my real life is complicated enough. I don't need to pick one, too. Um, oh, wow. I knew it was so weird. This is a discussion we've had. This picture of the young child. We said, does Don have a young child? No, nice, <laughs> nice. said, no. Said, interesting, interesting. Um, so, what did we decide? That this is a complicated issue. Can, can I get my own opinion, just as someone who runs the? I think you said the table. Sure. Um, I think there is a tremendous benefit to it, and I, I will tell you that I have had people. First of all, just because we don't live in that big of a town, I've had people come up to me and go, "Oh, I like you on Facebook." I have no clue who they are, um, but I also think that I've had a number of people who have approached me for things, or who have said they wanted to volunteer for committees and things like that, who otherwise wouldn't have, but because they saw it on Facebook, which was a medium that they were willing to use instead of maybe reading the New Paltz Times or going to the village website or town website for that matter, they did that. So I think that you you get a demographic who otherwise wouldn't see some of the things you're putting out there and you allow it to have um, a viral aspect and a communication aspect that you just simply can't have on a website. So you'll administer it? I would gladly do it. I do the, the Towns one and a few others as well. Oh, like, don't, don't, don't accept that. Just to um, play devil's advocate, I did post on Facebook in the new post, um, group that we were looking for researchers and I got zero response. Well, I don't think that's, that group doesn't that, that that group doesn't probably reach out to the right the demographic that you would want that would that would respond to that. Yeah. Um, respond you asked for else. insulters. You well, a lot of them. yeah. There <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. used to never be a shortage of comments until I posted that, and then today Andrea posted about the meeting, and there were no comments. Yeah. But everything else seems to get yeah, it's true. in the chat. Yeah. Discussion over best pizza place. That's a oh place gosh, right there. forty thread. Yeah, I um, I have to agree with Dan that I think there's a definite benefit to it. Um, I think that we would have to have as a group protocols for how it was handled, who posted on it, what was posted on it, um, whether or not we respond to comments, whether or not you know. And I, I, I again, I agree with Dan that you have to allow people to post on. It has to be interactive in some way, whether or not we go on and, and respond to everything, but others on the page should have some capacity to respond or else there's no, you should just have a website where interested parties can yeah, see. We could have on. a thing where somebody agreed they would check it once a week. Well, they wouldn't have to be, what, 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 would that work? Yeah, I mean, and if you have, <laughs> it's not my if you have I mean, here, I'll show you. If someone comments on my councilman page right now, it goes to my phone and I get the update. And I right. can do it right on my phone. So if any of you have an account, you'll see when it happens. You won't just go, oh, here it is. You'll know it's there and you'll yeah. have the opportunity to do it. And I often respond very quickly yeah. if you choose to do it. Yeah. Well, would you uh, email to me or to Andrea the, uh, uh, the social media uh, mm -hmm. policies? Yeah, I'd gladly do uh, that. That's a good starting point. I mean, and we're going to have, you know, we seem as a group to be generally in, in favor of it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, so let's have our, you know, over the course of the next meeting, we'll have this conversation again and try to nail it down. Mm -hmm. Yep. Well, the last one that we had years ago was put up by a student, and I thought it was really good because people were posting pictures of wildlife that they saw around the area, and uh, I think that um, I think that's very beneficial. Mm -hmm. Sounds good. All right, to be continued. All right. Now, this next issue, um, I'm really interested in it. I'm a little intimidated by the, the, the length of the, the document we received. I think it was 79 pages. And I, I, um, 
My own feeling is that's probably something that could be better discussed over a period of three or four hours, you know, around a table sometime, as opposed to over 15 minutes at this meeting. Okay. Um, but that's just me. Right. So well, we were supposed to make a list of recommendations. Um, I think that there's probably some recommendations we could make without even having read it, just based on the fact that it's 79 pages. My very first recommendation would be please don't print this. <laughs> <laughs> um, and my second one would be that because of the um, the fact that we're, it's it's old. I mean, it was supposed to come out in 2010. Um, that uh, we aim to put it up as a website, as a wiki of some kind that, it, that could be monitored. This is a whole different sort of can of worms than a Facebook group, but um, I think that uh, that's something that I would be definitely willing to monitor or to... Um, because... I mean, it's also the kind of thing where with, with the wiki, you have this like a whole, there's already sort of a protocol built into it. And um, I, I, don't, I don't know how any of you feel about that, but I feel like uh, it really is the most, most used to people if it's electronic and people can respond to it, you know. That's the kind of thing where if you have, if you're able to, you know, give out a URL, well, that it's, it's very useful, you know, for people, like if you see people walking in the woods or if people have questions about it, you know, you can uh, send them to information online about, about the Millbrook. And the thing about this particular report, one of the reasons that it's so long, um, aside from the fact that it's filled with a lot of sort of generic jargonish crap that shouldn't be printed, but one of the reasons it's so long is also because it recycles a lot of research that was already done years ago, which is now, of course, even older, but was the more sort of specific research than what was done by these consultants. Um, there's two, the Hudsonia report and the, also the one, the wetland report by Eric Kibiot. Both, all, like, the material from that was just, just re, re was, you know, this came from this came from Eric Kiviat's report, you know, and those are those date back from what 2004, 2006. So um, I feel like it might be just even a, a good idea to have a website that just had all gave people access to all of these reports because I feel like as taxpayers, you know, we've paid for all this and we have all this information, and um, that it might not be a bad idea to just have it to be publicly and electronically accessible, you know, and, and as far as, you know, being able to modify that information um, and have that modification, you know, monitored to a certain, certain extent, I think that that's a good idea too, but they wouldn't have to be mutually exclusive. This is the kind of thing where a static website would be of use. Let me, uh, let me make sure I understand your suggestion. Mm -hmm. Are you talking about this as the process for editing the report, or once it's edited, the process for putting it up for further modification? Yes. In other words, do we, you want to take 79 pages and put it up, or do you want to go through the 79 pages and whittle it down to something that... I, I think we could do up? both, um, because it's not... The state that it's in now isn't really sort of something you could print and hand out. It's not really user friendly in that to that for that. I mean the maps if you looked at the the printed version that that the, the version that was printed, the maps are really so tiny, like the details on the maps that you it really they really would be more useful um, online because then you can you know you can make them bigger. You don't have to you know sit there with a magnifying glass. And also um, you know a lot of them a lot of the maps are sort of, you know, sort of generic watershed maps. I mean, uh, I don't know, like, um, you know, it's it's not necessarily the kind of information a person would would need if they just, you know, wanted to learn about it. Like, you know, this, they're so heavy on details. Like, you know, this is the percentage of permeability, like, of the soil all, all over the park. And most people aren't going to necessarily want to look at a minuscule map of that before they go into the park. So there would be no, no point in printing that. 
Well, yeah, and I know the, the village board would like to um, receive a, a, uh, a version that has been looked at and presented as uh, here's, here's the version you should look at and consider passing. And uh, let me, uh, uh, I know um, they've asked for input from a couple sources. They've asked us to consider it. They've asked to look at, to talk to some of the authors. Um, so I think it'd be more efficient if there was one group and one body doing that process, the, the editing of the 79 pages down to some, here's what we think is, is the right version. And who do you think is right for that? I mean, I, you and I can do it, but we, we, there's other people who should probably, we should be involved in that too. Well, someone from Seawasp, definitely someone from the town. The town planning board hasn't seen it, neither has the village, I don't believe. Have, they haven't all seen it, even though it's been sort of available electronically to them. Um, you know, they had no idea that this was coming out and that, you know. But I don't think that's, I think there are two different topics here because um, we need to have some version of it, you know, to present to the DEC in order to satisfy the stipulations of the grant. And that version doesn't have to be, you know, a perfect user-friendly document. It just it has to stipulate the requirements. We don't want to lose that money. That's of tantamount importance. And I believe the the deadline that I saw from the email was August 31st. That's a, that's you know coming right up. So something needs to be submitted to them in order to satisfy that. I don't think I don't know whether it's possible to get an extension. Obviously, no. it's been several years now. It's, it's probably too late for that. So some version of it does, does need to be presented to them, but that's not the version that needs to be printed or disseminated by the village or the town. So because if you were to wait before, before turning this in to get approval from the village board, the, the town planning board and all that, if you were to wait to try to get that kind of approval, it's too late for that. It, has, it just has to be submitted in order to satisfy this grant. Otherwise, they're going to come back and say, oh, well, you paid these consultants, what was it, forty, fifty thousand dollars $50,000. We paid for this, and you gave us nothing. Now you have to pay for it. That would be the worst possible scenario. So even if it sucks, we should turn it in and get it. You know. It, it well, we're, so we're meeting on August twenty-six, and the deadline's in five days. Do you use some something you're planning on handing into DC or? The Sea Wasp is the group that is running this project. Um, they are submitting. They edited the the report. They're submitting that to the DEC to satisfy the grant. They will then, from what I remember, be submitting the same plan to town of the boards for their adoption. Um, so we, once we adopt those plans, we can use them as foundations to apply for grant money in next year's cycle, grant cycle. So it's not really important to have this be, be perfect. I mean... But as far know, as taking that 79-page document and giving it to something that the village board could review and accept. If, if the village board can't be accepting that page before, they probably shouldn't be on the village board. Um, you have to be able to read grown-up documents and not just the... the, the yeah, but there's a lot of judgments to be made. What, yeah, is this edit good? What to keep in? What to accept? What not? Well, we're so, not editing. The village board isn't editing this. I, mean, we, I suppose we could change it before we adopt it. But um, unless there's a really good reason to do that, but the science is bad, the conclusions are wrong, um, you know, there's factual errors. I don't know what would I don't know what would be changed. It's a it's a it's a it's a preserved management plan um, for a preserve that doesn't exist. So we need this also to start making this happen in the real world. Um, well, so with you, I'm, 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 I'm yeah. I'm not sure what I'm not sure what the editing edit, I'm not sure what the editing is, is where we're at right now with the public preserve. Well, I'm just going by what I heard at the last the last couple of village board meetings when this has come up. And I think there's one trustee in particular and with, with Sally who keeps saying, I want to talk to the authors, I want to have these people, I want to talk to these right. people. And, they're, and, they're just not ready. I, don't, and I don't know what the it's purpose of that ready. would be. Yeah. Um, but I, I think if the village board essentially is given this long document and asked to make it ready to approve, I'm not confident that's going to happen well or quickly. So I'm looking to see if there might be a smaller group yeah. That might say, here's what here's what we did. We recommend you can pick apart, change this and that. But to have the village board go through that document and make it final, that's that seems daunting to me. I mean, I, I'm I'm not. Well, I mean, honestly, I mean, it's ideally, the process should be that we read the thing 
and I've and I've read it several times by this point. Because um, um, I submitted some edits back in June or July. Um, the village board reads it. If we have any questions, we call the people who were drafting it. You know, not at the village board meeting, we call them, like like I call that meeting you. you know, hey, John, what do you mean by this? Why is this here? The village board is. In, educates themselves and answers all their own questions, which never happens. Um, and then we go to discuss it publicly. Um, and ideally, that should there really shouldn't be much discussion of those more at all. I mean, this is a multi-year project done by a group. Of, there was a group that, that met about, about this and the, the group that, that steered the project. Um, cool. But not to know, but, but there's no way to know. There's no way to know until we discuss it and we have it. Uh, at, at this point, I think we're we're moving out of that editing the document phase and into the getting the land together, getting looking for grant money to make it happen, um, and adopting the study is just one step on that. So I really, really hope that there's not a long, drawn out discussion on the flood board level. But I don't know. Um, so while I'm taking that. What I'm taking from that is that um, this body, you don't see a need for us to put a lot of time and comment into it. You think that the village board can? I think I think not a lot of um, really picky nuts and bolts because I mean it's I don't really know. I have no idea. Well, I'm I'm in favor of moving this forward. And I, I, I'm just trying to figure out what the process is that will most efficiently do that. And I, I think if we could have a group of people who maybe would be able to get along with each other and work together, go through the document and, and give the village board, here's what we think you should pass, that probably has a lot better chance I of going smoothly. I think it's a huge can of worms because okay. of what you leave on the cutting room floor. And I think it would step on a lot of toes because it would be discarded as work. Okay. Uh, the, the, but I think that that this body's recommendation to the village board as to whether or not we should adopt the plan, and if so, you know, if well, either way, if so why, if not why? Um, if there's a really strong reason for us not to adopt this, like the science is bad or the conclusions are wrong, then we could use that as. Or if you think that this is this plan is good enough to move forward to the next step. Um, or that the, the things that are left out or the things that, that need more work couldn't realistically be done all at once. You know, it could be that, that there's things pointed out in the study that need further study that we just didn't have, didn't get to. Um, okay, so what you're looking for from this body is a recommendation to accept or not to accept the edited version? I think that would probably be the, the, the most useful comment, yeah. you know. That sounds like another agenda item for next meeting. So we're going to need to I want to know what, go through uh, what that means. Accepting it, you know, especially it, considering to adopt, to, you know, to vote to adopt a majority of the board to make it official. It. Right. We it's so, now part of the, the official policy of the village government that this is going to happen. I see. And could such a thing be? Let's say someone had objections. Let's say the maps uh, were. I had spaces in them that weren't didn't show pre-existing conditions but showed places that were desirable for developers or something like that that was just really sort of uh, incongruous for a report that should be used for it. But could you just That's simply you, have... You guys to decide as, as in what your position is. Well, what I'm asking is, would it be possible to say, we adopt this plan but we object to this, this, and this? And that would be it. Technically, yes. Okay, thank you. That that seems like the way to go. For the most part. It would be what? I think it would be irresponsible for the most part. It would be irresponsible. Too much, not too much cutting. Oh uh, well, no. Of okay. something that was done by experts in the field. Well, we can right. we can talk about that next meeting, but I okay. think we could make a recommendation to accept or not accept, and we also recommend within the next ninety days that these actions be taken, or you look at these things, or what have you. We make recommendations, and they can take them or not. But I think we can we can put some uh, recommendations. We, we can say, yes, do this, 
and here are our, yeah, here are the things we really like, or we can say yes, do this, and we hear things that you might want to consider doing that would make it more complete. I think that's yeah, that that would be what our next discussion would be at the at the next meeting. So, okay, uh, we'll tee that up and try to have a recommendation to the uh, village board after our next meeting. And maybe have have the sea people who worked on it come to this meeting. See shit, they would come. I missed I mean, that. That would be the small group you're talking about. It's just the leadership of the project and you guys. That sounds like a really good idea. I'm, I meant to go to that meeting and I, I was ill. I didn't make it. And I could be so. wrong, but my feeling is that that's, that in and of itself is probably a, a meeting all by itself, if not two. So if we were to do that, I probably might want to suggest having an extra meeting. You know, having two meetings in one month and have one of them because that's a, that okay. just seems like if we try and do that in conjunction with a whole other meeting, I don't know how much it's going to get done. No, in the meantime, does something have to go to the DUC by the 31st? Sounds like that's that's it's keyed up. Taken care of. Taken care. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. Um, so, did you actually receive this document in paper form or? In email form. Email form? Yes. Okay. I didn't print it. I didn't see how many pages it was. <laughs> it was one of 79. I was, oh my goodness. Not in this lunch hour, you know. <laughs> um, all right, re researchers. I, I think researchers will come from because of their interest in individual items. So I think as, you know, as we have people come to meetings and, and speak out of this or that or whatever, I, I, I just think that's a good opportunity for... Uh, for getting researchers, I think we, in in the example with the Wallkill River, I think there are obvious places to turn to, and we could uh, look to Riverkeeper to be a researcher or individual from you know we could I don't know I guess what I'm trying to say and not saying at all articulately is that um, I think we have each have a responsibility to try to figure out who's going to research for us or we end up doing it ourselves um, and. I think that's a direct, the amount of interest we'll get in research will be directly related and correspond to the excitement we create around an, an, an issue or how much it resonates. So I think the, I, I think the, um, I'm hoping the walk hill will resonate. I think if you hadn't done so much research already, maybe people looking to, to help you on a plastic bag thing, I think Millbrook Preserve is something where, where there are people in town. There are at least two people in town, I don't know their names, who care about this enough to want to spend some more time in I mean, I can, they are. I can say anecdotally that, um, you know, I've tried to find researchers on my own and have had a difficult time. So I'm wondering if there's outreach that we could do to specific organizations, perhaps identify them and, you know, s somehow engage different interest groups, whomever, uh, college oh groups. What about a letter to the editor? I think the campus clubs are fine. Yeah, it can't hurt. But I don't know what I think um, right a lot of the editor and press releases, um, those go out looking for volunteers regularly, yeah. and so I think that's always really good. We have an environmental group I know, because I reached out to the responses and their letters to the editor. Um, it's just... It's become less and less. Um, but I mean, can you send a letter to local Nyperg group and see if anyone there is interested in doing it? Can you send? Uh, that's just the first thing that came to mind. Well, well for which topic? I mean, for a different topic, it's it's going to be a different. different but there's no group. real environmental. I mean, I'm more. Uh, the researchers that I've been able to get have all been through like through science, through the biology club or hydrogeology yeah. majors and that sort of thing. It's not usually an active an activist group. Well, um, and I know public access has been have had a lot of success in getting interns through the through SUNY. So if there were a particular department that pertained to an issue you were looking at and you reach out to the chair, they do have an intern policy and procedure for unpaid interns. Mm -hmm. You want something to look like look good in your resume. Yeah. You know? Come work for the Environmental Policy Commission for six months. Could have our own interns. We could. The, the commission could could offer one. Well, but I think as the law is written that establishes us, uh, each commissioner is charged with ha with Two with researchers. having two researchers. Right. So we'll need to. I, I don't think having a researcher for the group right. would satisfy that. 
So uh, let's just keep working on that. We're young groups. At the moment, we're we're okay. We've been okay doing our own research, but uh, um, I'm just thinking the issue with the Wallkill and others are going to get a little more complicated. So we'll. Uh, it's going to be a lot of research. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> that sounds great. Um, so we have a number of issues we've identified that I think we're working toward. Um, are there any new issues that we want to you know put on the table or, or introduce to the group? We are our next deadline is to go to the village board December 1st and say here are our official recommendations or have been. I think we will have made one already with regard to plastic bags, but that's kind of our next, uh, the end of our next season, if you will, is December 1st, and then we'll need to report back to them on June 1st, 2015. So anything you want to tee up for work in the balance of, uh, of this year, think about it. Shoot me an email, we'll talk about it next meeting, get on the agenda. But I think uh, time is getting short for new items we're going to act on in 2014. So give us if there's anything we're missing or you're thinking about it, passionate about, you know, uh, there's still time. And we are looking for one additional commissioner and we're looking for a number of researchers uh, who can uh, work at their own pace and their own time and their own speed on some of these various issues. Uh, that said, if I had a gavel, I would pound it. I think we are adjourned. Yes, we're okay. Oh, I'm so sorry. Okay. Uh, did everyone have a chance to uh, review the minutes? Yes. I yeah. thought they were good. No. I didn't see anything. Okay. All right, next meeting. Yes. Yeah. 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 Yeah.